Hi there, my name's Dougal Henschel and I'm a features writer for yachtsandyachting.com and Sailworld with a special interest in the historical aspects of the development of the racing dinghy primarily here in the UK. Now this is going to be the first in a link series of videos that are intended to celebrate the life and boats of John Westall whose centenary would be occurring early in 2021. Today I'm here at Western Sailing Club on the eastern shore of Southampton Water, an area that is very much one of the spiritual homes of the 505, the dinghy that is almost a singular definition of John's life as an innovative dinghy designer. The surprise though in this story is that it will not just be about the boats but also about the social situations that were prevalent at the time. Most of all though, the dinghy development timeline will be about a small, elite group of highly talented individuals who will sit at the heart of this story, and they of course are the dinghy designers. Their numbers are few, and start with the likes of George Cockshot and Morgan Jars before the Uffa Fox era came to de dominate dinghy design from the late 1920s right the way through to the mid-1950s. By then the Wisdom Putney, Jack Holt, was busy and successfully democratising the very nature of the sport of dinghy sailing. Almost concurrent with Jack's reign, Ian Proctor would emerge to replace Fox as the leading designer of the restricted development dinghy that was such a part of the growing UK scene. However, in the early 1950s, the very nature of dinghy sailing would be changing fast, with the arrival of what the then IYU would call performance sailing. Fox, Holt and Proctor would all respond to these new demands with designs that in their own way would challenge the existing idea of what a performance dinghy should be only for the IYU to struggle in their search for a winner that could justifiably called, be called the ultimate racing dinghy. Instead, it would be an outsider who, despite lacking that track record of the big three, would recognise best what the term ultimate sailing dinghy really meant. This brings us to that far-sighted and highly innovative designer, Woodroff John Westall, and incidentally back here to Weston, for are there members still here today who remember John and his boat Coronet sailing down in Chichester Harbour. Thankfully, despite the passage of time, I've been able to get these first-hand accounts and I'd like to go on record with my thanks for all their input into this story. Their knowledge of John as a sailor, designer, boat builder and so much more has lent a real authenticity to this narrative. Yet even these details still fail to tell us the whole story. For that we know need to go to the one person who knew him the best, his daughter Gillian, who's now going to tell us more about John as a man dedicated to his family, yet equally in love with his boats. This means leaving here at Weston and travelling down to Devon to Exmouth. Wow. Isn't modern technology wonderful, as it has not only moved us 100 miles plus westward here to X Sailing Club, but it's also taken us back 75 years as well. When dinghy racing fully restarted in 1945, the club here at X already had a great reputation as one of the leading locations for the sport, with this area being a hotspot for innovation, quality and success. Little wonder then that just around the quayside from here is the boatyard that carries the name of Rosal Brothers, where so many race and championship winning boats were made. Go back another 10 or 15 years from then, and this area would have been not just a playground for the young John Westall, but a fertile spot where his own qualities of innovation, quality and success would have been forged. But now let's bring in John's daughter Gillian, who can tell us more about her father and about how his early life here on the X and his sailing would shape his life going forward. I can only speak about Dad really as I remember him as his daughter, not necessarily about how he was with his boats, just, just for the moment to answer your question. And he, I just remember this 
very large, reassuring physical presence. And uh, yes, he was big and strong, kind and gentle, also very confident and solid as a rock. Well, he, the, the family lived in Exeter, in a, in a large, in a Victorian crescent of large townhouses. But they had, across the water from here, round the corner, is a sand spit on the other side of the estuary, known as Dawlish Warren. And there was a sort of village of ramshackle wooden summer abodes uh, on, on there. And the family had one of those. They spent all their summers uh, at Dawlish Warren. And John was a member here at X? He, he must have become a member at some stage during his boyhood, yes. And did he have much success as a young man here? Well, I, I don't know about you know when he was really young, but certainly he did quite well as a teenager, when still a teenage schoolboy. Oh, he won the Short House Cup for utility boats two years running, when I think he was aged about 15 and 16. So he, the, the talent was there for um, boating from an early age? Oh yes, I think it had probably become an obsession <laughs> quite an early age. Yeah, well, was I, he can a, I just yeah. say why I think he really took to sailing in a big way was because of his mother. Um, he was very close to his mother and she um, died suddenly and unexpectedly when he was only 11. Oh. His brother was six and a um, sister was only two. And I know that it affected my father very deeply. And well, he didn't talk about it, but I, I do know. And um, I think he found great solace. It was when it happened when they were down at, at the bungalow. Oh, Christ. And um, I think, you know, sailing, knocking, you know, getting into a boat and having to concentrate brought great solace. And I think that set him on, on his life's course. We think of John very much as a designer. Uh, what point did this um, interest in design start to uh, become apparent? Well, I, I guess uh, maybe when he, he did design and build a, a rudimentary little dinghy for his younger brother, which um, he sailed around, you know, sailed over there. Um, it, you know, it wasn't a great, great looker, uh, but that was the first thing. And then after the war, when he came back here and he wanted to take part in um, racing International 14s. He designed his own International 14, which was going to be innovatively called Storm Along, <laughs> um, which he intended to build o um, over the winter of 1946 and 7 and sail it in 47. Um, but though he, he was stymied in that because of the post-war timber restrictions. Okay. And that then, he then decided he'd better buy himself a second-hand one in order to be able to race at all. And that's when dear old Nimbus came into the, onto the... So he's now here saying 14s, and I'm hoping that we're going to, in a minute, have some film of these 14s and National 12s sailing here in those early years just after the war. We will let this short clip of National 12s and International 14s racing here at X nearly 70 years ago bring this first video to a close. I hope you've enjoyed it and that you can join us again in just a couple of weeks for part two, for this is when the pace of the action, not to mention the speed of the boats, will really start to heat up as the IYRU go out in search for what they wanted was the ultimate in racing dinghies. For now, though, on behalf of Gillian, X Sailing Club, the team at yachtsandyachting.com and Sail World, and of course from myself, can we wish you all the very warmest of seasons greetings, along with high hopes that finally 2021 will bring you all a full, happy and successful sailing season.